talks and I, I gotta say I'm so excited to be at a show that really investigates and gets involved with biophilic design a subject I've been passionate about for well, most of my life but at least certainly over the last 10 years so uh, planted seeks to be the first show to connect people spaces and nature to create happier healthier greener spaces to live and work in and in the first of our talks program, we are going to be investigating exactly that subject, a subject key to the foundation of planted biophilic design. So um, we've got three fantastic speakers. Um, so although the concepts of biophilia have been around since the 1970s, seemingly it's only recently that these ideas are becoming more public and becoming more aware. Uh, about this sort of very compelling nature-based, evidence-based approach to how we create happier and healthier places to live and work in the city. So for those of you that don't know, that is great because you're going to become experts as a result of all three speakers. Biophilia is a term that was coined uh, in the 1970s by Eric Fromm um, that relates to humans' innate attraction to nature and natural processes. And it explains why we seek out nature when we're feeling stressed. So think about when you go on holiday and you head for the, the beaches and the forests and the mountains because you know that nature makes you feel good. So... Um, the development of this ethos uh, was then sort of created by the likes of Edward O. Wilson and Stephen Kellett, who created a set of design patterns that we now know of as biophilic design, uh, which is how we bring these ideas into the built environment, into our cities, our streets, and our neighborhoods. So in the first of Planted's panel discussions, we bring together a fantastic and very diverse uh, set of speakers from the world of architecture, academia, and kind of general knowledge and communication and indirect references to nature to investigate exactly how and why biophilic design is important and how we bring it into the places that are so important to us. So I'd like to introduce uh, immediately in, in order here, uh, Roddy Langmuir from Cullinan Studio. We have uh, Dr. Alia Fidel from Leeds Beckett University and Vanessa Champion from the Journal of Biophilic Design. So all coming from quite different perspectives. Uh, the format of the talk will essentially be that each of them will stand up and introduce themselves for five minutes. And then we're going to have a series of questions. I suspect that uh, it's going to be difficult for us to take questions from the floor, but they're going to have so much to say. I think you're going to learn an awful lot. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Alia Fidel to introduce herself and her work. Uh, Alia. Thank you very much. Give her a little round of applause. It's the first speaker at Planted on Earth. Thank you, Alia. Tell us a little bit more about your, yourself and your work. Hello. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, and thank you, Oliver, and thank you for Planted for hosting such really important um, uh, cause. Uh, my name is Alia Fadel. I started my journey with biophilia and biophilic design many years ago, but I took quite a different approach. I started from architecture engineering, uh, where um, I did my uh, bachelor degree of architecture and engineering in Egypt. And then during this, I started feeling that um, I have a great passion towards landscape, towards understanding why we want to integrate landscape into our architecture, why it's a very important part of it. And then having also having my parents as doctors in the medical field, the human health aspect was always uh, embedded in my approaches and thinking and I wanted to know more and do, by by thinking uh, about a lot of questions I felt like okay we like nature I like to integrate them into my architecture design but why why this is important to me and then from there I started I moved to Chicago uh, as an international Fulbright scholar to work on my master degree in landscape architecture and then I started knowing more and more about landscape and from there I moved to my PhD and with my PhD it was 
the questions became more about about re about finding the the exact answers for my questions and from there i started investigating the biophilia and the biophilic design and many many aspects of my questions becomes clear to me and it starts to make sense to me and their connection and relationship between our health and well-being between what we like and dislike about the environmental qualities of the spaces started to make a lot of sense when we understand that there is no separation between between the relationship between nature and human being we can coexist we can co-restore we can co-survive and it's not about either or relationship between what we design and what we uh, and us as our as um, from a health and from health and well-being perspective, actually, it has to be both. It has to be co-survival and revival to succeed and to be able to live in this earth and uh, to live in pleasure and happiness and health. Um, and from there, that's what I'm trying to convey to my students in Leeds Beckett. And that's what we do. They are starting to think about a project called Survival and Revival, Urbanism, Health and Resilience. And they start to think about how they can play a role. What is the prospective impact of their proposals? How they can help with but looking from um, from the lens of, ha of of health and well-being and climate change, how this can be part of what they can do without without neglecting the in the importance of nature and also the importance of human health and well-being and pleasure in the urban context. So, great, thank, thank you very much, uh, Roddy. Tell us some more about your work and your life uh, at Cullinan Studios. Okay, thanks. I think um, I've probably uh, probably been asked to talk here because, I mean, our practice is about a mile down the canal um, in that direction. Uh, the canal is a wonderful natural thread running through London. Um, really beautiful to see uh, the access that it gives to Londoners, you know, to, uh, to the natural world. But our, our practice has been working for maybe, uh, well, since the 60s, it was formed in the 60s. So before biophilia was a thing um, and uh, there's a natural affinity in our practice with working with nature many of our buildings um, are integrated quite closely with the natural world so I think it's something which we instinctively felt as a practice and that we've um, you know we've developed um, my own background I was brought up in the the Cairngorm mountains in the what's now become the national park um, and so I, I had a, a up, my father ran an outdoor pursuit center. So I grew up, you know, in the mountains every day. Um, and I suppose living in London, um, there's a sort of disconnect you feel between that kind of level of nature um, and the city, which there doesn't really need to be. I mean, London's one of the, the better cities in the world for its relationship to nature. But um, I, think, I think so much more can be done. So um, we have uh, been working on a number of projects. We're working on a um, mental health project in Liverpool, uh, which is really interesting seeing how um, an approach to design with biophilic patterns can help kids who are, you know, who are struggling. Um, we're, we're doing, uh, we've done visitor centers in botanic gardens where the connections are very, very obvious. But always we're trying to gather buildings around uh, courtyard gardens um, and really work with circulation spaces. And I think one of the things you mentioned in the start, Oliver, is not, it's not just about nature. It's also um, about patterns which affect the psychology. Um, so looking for refuge spaces, um, giving long views. You know, buildings don't have to be enclosing uh, barriers. They can project long views, which uh, a relief, they, they release the, the, the mind and the spirit, you know, out of, out of the building. So all these things become part of uh, what we need to be trying to do with, with design. So shall I Lovely. pass on? Great, thank you. And Vanessa from the Bio Journal of Biophilic Design. Hello, hello, hi. Um, yeah, I'm Vanessa. Um, I'm editor of uh, the Journal of Biophilic Design. It's a podcast series, so <laughs> sign in and have a, have a listen. <laughs> um, my, my journey started off when I was about sort of a teenager. Um, I started being really interested in natural living and why 
um, you know, our homes started making us sick. Uh, you know, there was obviously VOCs coming off paint work and all this sort of stuff. So I slowly <laughs> started convincing parents and friends and things to start living in a kind of more natural life. Um, my own then, my journey then went on to academia. Um, like yourself, I, I've got a PhD in Greek and Latin, can you believe? Um, but I specialised in um, architecture, ancient architecture and environment. And I'm also a photographer and a filmmaker, so I've always been interested in how the visual can affect us our sort of mental capacity to process information, to be happy um, and, and to be productive and creative and also to commune with each other. Um, as obviously looking at ancient world, you know, and their architecture and how they, you know, how pathways through and all this sort of stuff and how, particularly like the natural healing centers, I was quite fascinated by it. So like the Asclepian, there's an, there's an interesting uh, podcast actually with uh, Dr. Patty Baker on the podcast. So if you're interested in um, sort of ancient world and where it's come from, <laughs> um, it's worth, worth having a listen to that. But um, sleeping in nature and being surrounded by nature is really important. In terms of the photography um, and where I'm interested in, um, sort of why biophilic imagery and views like you mentioned and sort of the prospect and refuge how we can create environments where because we're all stuck indoors and often it's four walls and we can't see anything we don't have views if you can put a uh, a view of nature in so it creates a space looking out um, obviously it's proven now that you know roger ulrich did this study that um you need you need less uh, medication you can get out of hospitals a lot quicker um so my, my journey through that was that my, both my parents were in hospital and uh, my father died, unfortunately, but he spent his last days looking at ceiling tiles. And I was like, well, what's that about? You know, I mean, why can't they have like clouds on the ceiling? And it's like, it's a, you know, it's a no brainer, surely. Um, but my mother, she was in an isolation thing. So I took in pictures of nature, my own pictures, which had views. And so she started, um, so her delirium started coming down, her blood pressure came down and she stopped saying, when are they coming in, when are they coming in, when are they coming in? So I, being obviously just saying about my academic background, I wanted to research why, why it's like that, you know, what the evidence is. So that's kind of why I set up the Journal of Biophilic Design, a bit of sanity, <laughs> um, but I also publish now, um, and, and I partner with manufacturers to try and get views of nature into, um, into interiors and, and, and that sort of thing. So, okay. Thank you. So, I mean, you know, we've, we've been living in the built environment for one way or another for hundreds of thousands of years since we stopped becoming hunters and gatherers and moved into sort of small uh, agricultural communities. Um, and in a way, the reason for architecture for, for a vast amount of that is to kind of keep nature out, which is sort of dangerous and threatening to us. Why, why now? Why, I mean, why is this show here? Why are we here talking about biophilic design? Why has it become suddenly so relevant and so important across these different areas, whether it's sort of the architecture, academia, or, or the communication of it and, and people's experiences in buildings. Um, Vanessa, uh, since you've... Okay, yeah. okay. Um, well, I, th I think like you say, it's, um, it is so important right now. Um, we are shutting four walls, we've had lockdown, we've had COVID, and it's not just here in the UK, so it's all around the world. Um, there's a climate crisis, there's all this stuff going on as well, and, and the time is now, and biophilic design is the key to creating better environments for everybody and also for um, for the environment, because it, by its very nature, it, it, it um, encourages sustainability because it's sustainable materials and it's wood and, and all this sort of stuff. But it's, but yeah, why are we here now? Um, it's because it we don't if we don't do it now we're it's going to be too late and and that's why this is so important and everybody here today you know if you take away something that you can then employ you know employ in your own practice or in your own homes and lives i think it's incredibly important um and just through the people i'm interviewing and in, on the on the journal by foot down you um I'm, I'm just there's so many exciting things happening sustainability things and you know like his, like yourselves you know doing amazing beautiful things that we can all be inspired by and th yeah that's that's why it's really important to know that we all come together as a community to learn from each other education is key and sharing information and sharing education is is the key point so. and Ali obviously you work in the realm of education you're teaching students but of course uh, student mental well-being is something that seems to become much more apparent what why is this subject happening now I mean I remember when I was studying architecture 
people were having nervous breakdown because of the workloads. And it was just like, now they couldn't do it. They were, they were losers. I mean, it was yeah, horrendous. It was horrendous. Why, why now? Why are we now thinking about biophilic design, both student well-being, but also in the way that it's being taught and integrated into architectural education? Yeah, that's a very important point because students' health and well-being is is, is really something serious when we're talking about. And I hope, but I, I can see a lot of potentials in 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 integrating moments of biophilic design into not only into the campuses and the settings, the physical settings, but even into the curriculum we're teaching when we're trying to integrate moments where students. Um, multi-sensory experiences are um, acknowledged and they become part of the process. They are human beings and they are designed for human beings and much more. They design for other subjects as well. They design for flora, for fauna, and it's really important for them to feel that they are an active participant. They are not just passive designing for the others. They are not. They are human beings who are and they are designing from the when they feel that their multi-sensory experiences are acknowledged and appreciated into the process, they become more sensitive and they become more bold with their statements. And that's something really, really valuable. And especially with the post-pandemic, if we want to talk about recovery, green recovery and resilient, which is a notion that's happening in UK and all over the world post-pandemic, it's really important to think about these very important interrelationship between human health and well-being, student health and well-being, and, and it, the, the nature, the contact with nature, the biophilic, uh, at the bi biophilia as a core, and the biophilic applications of it. And the COVID-19 kind of put all humanity at in, in, in a survival mode. It was like a big trauma. And students, no exception. And the accumulative nature of stress, like students could be suffering from chronic stress, acute stress, episodic stress, and all accumulative, accumulative. And that's why biophilic moments can really interrupt the accumulative nature of stress. And that's something very important. And it's equally important for students than also for us going to our work, going to our daily cycles of activities and how those tiny moments of contact with nature and mediums with na mediums of nature simulation within the built environment, whether even like since you mentioned from a, a particular uh, definition of biophilia, because he talked about the passionate love of life and of all that is alive. It is, it is the wish to further growth whether in a person, a plant, an idea, or social group. So there are multiple interpretations that we can take the idea of the restorative potentials of biophilia and the biophilic design and implement it for our health and well-being and for our students' health and well-being as well. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm going to move on to Rod in a moment. One question. Um, Gen Zs, the Generation Z, um, there is a sense that they are, you know, they're digital natives. They've grown up with broadband. They've grown up with phones, smart devices. There is a sort of little, I guess, some level of cynicism that are they really able to connect with nature in the same way that many of us who didn't have that level of alternative media? I mean, are they still connecting with nature? Uh, or is it, is it like inherent? Is it genetic that we all connect with nature? I'm interested just to hear if they are connecting with nature in the same way that I did when I was growing up running through forests and mountains and through streams and through the sea. Are Gen Z still connected with nature? Yes, I believe so, but then in their own way. And so we, we, so all of us, it's really individual interpretation of our connection with nature. The core is the same. We all have this biophilic evolutionary basis. We tend to connect to nature nature just to survive it, to breathe, to be, to be alive in many ways. But the way we each of us interpret this is different. And for the younger generation, it's just different. But right. it's happening. Like when I say in, in an online session after the me and my students spending like three hours staring at the screen, I just say, make sure you open your window. Make sure you take your laptop next to the sunny spot in your room and move with the sun how it goes. So you, you take the tech with you, basically, but you're, exactly. you're inversing in nature. In nature. Yeah. So, so Roddy, um, again, that, that same question to you about why now? I mean, yeah. Why does it seem to have risen up the agenda? You've said that you've been doing it for a long time, but 
this is something that a, few, a lot of people have only heard about in the last few years. Why has it become so important to architecture? Well, I think, I mean, I think architecture isn't separate from the forces that are affecting all of us in all our lives and all, um, you know, all disciplines as well. So I think the the, the massive changes that have gone on with the, the pressure um, on the planet um, are coming home to roost. You know, we used to probably for 150 years, you know, we've been developing uh, where the driver is, um, the drivers for construction, for instance, have always been, you know, uh, cost drivers, but very narrow cost drivers, not, not counting the cost to the planet of making decisions and letting the, the planet sweep up after us, if you like. Um, and that's been going on for long enough. It's now, it's now hit, hitting back. So I think there's a realization in many, many fields. I mean, it's really interesting that in economics um, that the Treasury commissioned uh, the Das Gupta report uh, on the economics of biodiversity, which is a completely different way of looking, you know, uh, looking at economics. And if you bring that back into, you know, into our profession and into construction, you can see that we have to change, you know, uh, with all these other professions, we have to change too. And I think the, 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 that means lots of technical things like working towards um, a more circular economy where materials are not, uh, not wasted, you know, that we, we use natural materials that store carbon. Uh, we make buildings so that they, the materials can be recycled when those buildings have uh, finished their life or move on. They're adaptable, flexible. All of these things become more important now uh, when you try to think of, of a balanced um, sort of almost like a, a, an ecological system, you know, that uh, building is part of that. And so once you think of buildings as, as part of circular systems, then you start to see how nature has to be drawn into everything uh, that, that we do. I think we're measuring much more now. We're measuring better. So we're understanding the consequences of the things, things we're doing. You're talking about physiological, you know, measurements and physiological impacts of, of uh, design, but I think also, you know, measuring carbon. And we used to think we had to just uh, save energy. You know, it was all about uh, saving energy, but it's far more complex than that. And a holistic view of the role of a designer um, it has to cover all of these different things. Hmm. Okay, so you're starting to touch on some of the, the measuring. One of the fascinating things that really engaged me right at the beginning about biophilic design was that it's an evidence-based approach. It's unlike any other sort of architectural style that we've ever had before. You know, if you think about, uh, you know, classical architecture or, or modernism and how we've adhered to it and been taught it and said, you know, this is good, this is clean, it's good to be like a machine. And that there aren't really any metrics that say, you know, modernism is great because it's done it doing this for us. Biophilic design is based on evidence. And, you know, maybe we could just talk about that for a moment. Talk, tell me a little bit more about the value that bringing nature into our cities can bring. How do we create a business case around it that demonstrates it's, it's good for people and it's good for planet? Uh, Roddy, as, as you've got the microphone. Okay, well, I think, I, think, um, I think measurement is vital to us because we need evidence to take to clients um, to say, look, this works. You know, you might just think it's a nice to have. It might be on the nice to have list, you know, that uh, that's to the side of the main core of the design. But if you can prove it's going to make people do their jobs better, be more productive. I mean, lots, lots of things that uh, that that even even the most um, economically minded client would be really interested in. Then uh, you've got the evidence to get that into the design. So we don't. I mean, we don't go and sit in an ivory tower. And, and work as designers. You know, we have to work with, with uh, large teams and often with large teams of client groups. And so bringing a collective vision that includes, uh, includes uh, connection to nature, includes you know, uh, the, all, all the uh, patterns which we're talking about, biophilic patterns, to make the building do its job better, then that's, that's the way to do it. So I think, um, you know, some of them seem intangible, but I think when you, I was actually talking earlier, I was really interested in getting a study done on some of our work um, from the past, and we may be able to set something up on that, because I think, I think um, the physiological tests that you can do um, on, on people, we've had it done in our own office, where um, people come in and did a study, and people sitting in different places in our office, 
the, the daylight, the noise background, the views that they had, the environment they were in, the level of artificial light, lots testing lots of lots of things and measuring heart rates and, and uh, physiological responses. So, so even just around, you know, in one space, um, you can get quite a, quite a different um, you know, picture. And that starts to tell you how to design space. Hmm. That's the point. That yes, you can use those pre and post occupancy evaluations to inform you yeah. next time. Uh, Alia, tell me about some of the research, because obviously you're coming from the academic perspective. You'll, you'll know there are hundreds of studies that demonstrate um, why bringing nature into spaces is good for business. Yeah, that's very true. There are endless research studies from from very interesting and diverse lenses because you can find people talking about and researching about health about the the value of even visual contact so it's not only the the multi-sensory but even if you focus on a single uh, a single sense like when like the visual contact or even the auditory contact all of this are been been proven in many many research studies from diverse fields that it supports human health and well-being in many ways like it reduces blood pressure it mitigates stress it it uh, uh, it helps recovering from uh, mental exhaustion and uh, uh, and voluntary attention fatigue it helps with blood pressure reducing blood pressure meantime it boosts uh, positive feelings, sense of pleasure, sense of community, even uh, boost positive um, uh, social interaction with people, productivity, neurological nourishment, and many, many others. I think like the kind of the medical field did really amazing work in proving that it, that contact with nature and mediums of nature simulation is 100% good for us as human beings. But I think what we can do from like a biophilic design perspective is more and more of the implementation of this because um, it's been proven. So it's not anymore about what about our utopian thinking of nature. It's not about the faraway land where we will get restored and healed and come energetic. No, it's not about this. That's been proven even five to seven minutes or some research studies are even saying less than this like three minutes of exposure to nature-based stimuli is enough to break the accumulative nature of the stress of the tension that we live in and and some other research studies was talking about also like how this can help making us creative, making us productive. And all of this very important and been proven to us. It just needs to be implemented more in our designs, in our life, even in, in tiny moments. It doesn't have to be in the far away. It doesn't have to be the long month vacation somewhere. It could be, and it and I believe personally that it will be even more useful if it's integrated in the worst and the harshest environments. That's where it's most needed. Great. And uh, Vanessa, um, yeah. obviously Al Ali has been talking about the kind of benefits of real forms of nature. And we obviously always tend to think, oh, it's, it's plants, it's trees, it's water. But obviously a lot of your work has been involved in the, in the, in the um, replication of nature in mm -hmm. the built environment, in, in what we call the indirect references to nature and digital imagery. Does that level of research exist in, in terms of how we replicate nature and does it bring benefits? I mean, have those studies actually happened in terms of, you know, looking at TV screens or, or yeah. printed images? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned before about Gen Z. Are they getting out and about? Um, there's a thing called techno biophilia that um, Sue, of course, I was saying, Sue Thomas is, is sort of, sort of um, conjuring. Um, but people are looking at, um, at their screens. They're kind of, you know, we've got pictures on our phones. If you have a screensaver, that sort of thing. Our interaction with nature can be brought in that way through our through technical. Um, yeah, but there are, there's loads of, uh, um, as I said, we've mentioned Oryx, um, study before. Um, I just wanted to make you just bring back actually about the sort of economic uh, benefits. Um, it really is important and there has been shed loads of studies on that. I mean it, it will reduce the stress on the NHS because there's less need for in interventions and um, um, hospital stays, it gets people out of beds quicker because they, you know, they've got a view of nature. So back to the, you know, the views of nature thing, um, you know, and, and also people with ADHD, if they're in, a, in an environment where 
they can see nature or they can touch things and auditory as well if you know i'm working with the hearing conservation association but if you can create an environment which is better acoustically because obviously in nature we don't have walls <laughs> but we're in four walls and obviously if you've got um if you're um, you know, highly sensitive, then having a very noisy environment and, and an open workplace um, uh, can create stress. So creating a better biophilic um, enhanced environment will take the pressure off helping those people um, and all the sort of interventions and things that needed from there. Plus also people love being by lakes and water and that, so it pushes price of, rev you know, of your residential properties up and stuff. There's shed loads of um, a sort of uh, economic uh, benefits. But yeah, sorry, back to your thing. So I just have, oh, I've got loads of studies on it and loads of information. So um, if you need anything, I just can pump it out. Um, but um, yeah, so prospect and refuge is a, is a thing that we talk about in, um, in biophilia. So creating, um, views of nature where you're kind of where you're sort of like you know like like people are here now you're sort of you're tucked under trees you know you're kind of like oh this is nice under here isn't it oh um, but you're looking out you know so I mean like if this wasn't here you'd be looking out of the view over there so that's why these little seats are here and stuff you know so it's just a natural environment so you think about when we were when we were primitive things <laughs> we were hiding in caves you know we were waiting you know that flight and fight thing is like oh, what's that what's that over there if we as long as we can hide ourselves and we can kind of you know feel protected um, but yeah there's there's studies on that too so yeah great okay so um we're obviously sitting here in front of this kind of beautiful wild meadow wall it's a little bit like a big green hug and it is it really is absolutely lovely to be here and it really is kind of acoustically separating us from some of the other noises and distractions beyond us but What's lovely about a wild meadow is, is the sense of diversity. And if you come afterwards to come and take a closer look, it, it's full of different plants and species and colors. It's really rich. This idea of diversity is a subject that we talk about a lot in the office. And, it, and it's now a subject that we're talking about socially, geographically, uh, across sort of nature species. I'd just like to sort of ask you how you're thinking about this idea of diversity of uh, connections with nature across your different fields. Uh, Roddy, how are you bringing this sense of richness? It could be spaces or plants or whatever. Well, uh, maybe maybe I'll talk first uh, with the different subjects we'll cross, I guess, but political, uh, you know, accessibility to space. So I think, um, you know, it, a lot of people fight for a public space in our cities, and that's so valuable, um, you know, that, that we don't privatize our cities. Um, there's always a threat to that, that you know, happening. So I think it's a, it's a very important, uh, important angle to this that we we need to um, you know be aware of. Um, I think you know, as an architect, you often you often bring different uses together. Um, so I think a, another angle is the diversity of use. Mixed up buildings are far more interesting than the zoned places that we used to create you know we we've we've traditionally zoned our housing out into suburbs we've zoned our industry we've we've uh, zoned our retail when you mix things up king's cross is actually quite a good example of a of a mixed up use space um lots of things happening here a uh, very diverse mix of uh, mix of activities and they all enrich each other so i think my my um diversity angle there would be just to to be encouraging um, uh, all those interfaces to happen cheek by jowl um, in, in cities. One of the wonderful things that cities can do is is create that kind of dynamism. So a, a really rich mix of spaces. I think a lot of people walking around will, will get that sense of the joy of being here. Sorry about that. Alia, talk to us about the di sense of diversity. Yeah, that's a very good point, especially like when you think about the recovery post pandemic, the green equality and the fair access to urban landscape becomes really, really important topic, like not thinking about if you're from like the biophilic perspective, from the prospect and refuge perspective, if like again, like to COVID-19 put all humanity at a survival mode. So this was like the big hazard. So our shelter, our protection were our homes. 
where we feel safe away from the pandemic, away from the intense exposure. And at the same time, we're watching the world, we're watching the news, we're hoping for the best. And the only contact, real contact, is just opening our window. So the view from your window becomes your only opportunity for a prospect. What's going on here? So if when you open your window, you have, you, you get a chance to see plants, you get a chance to hear a bird singing, you get a chance to see a running squirrel, that's, that's amazing. But if you don't have this chance, if you open your window and see an even more stressful stimuli, what's going to be the case? So the, the fair access to urban green landscapes becomes a necessity, becomes a survival necessity for our cities and for urban inhabitants. Meantime, biophilia and biophilic design is a very inclusive concept, by the way. And it accommodate many, many cultural interpretations and many lenses, like the lens that each one of us has, the lens that each of our audience has right now, interpreting this into their own personal experiences is diverse and is inclusive by nature. Vanessa. Yeah. Oops, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I completely agree with you. Um, I mean, if you're in an inner city and you're in a block of flats, I think that's it. Um, being able to create uh, pocket parks, um, mini forests, places where people can come together and feel safe, um, I think is incredibly important. I mean, kids that, that you know, are living in these inner city places that, it, it, I mean, it, you know, we've all, we've all seen it and we may have lived in it. You know, we might have lived in a council uh, estate where there's not a lot going on. It's not very concrete. Um, creating a softness um, in, in with planting and community gardens and, and vegetable gardens. I mean, that incredible edible, and I can never pronounce the name, Todd Morden, Timun, <laughs> Um I mean, that's just, I mean, what a fantastic thing. I don't know if you know about it, but these, these community gardens where people are planting vegetables and, and then everybody can come, but it's a place where people can do, they're doing it in Manhattan. They're doing it in all the cities. They're doing it, doing it in, you know, in London and, and Camden and, and all sorts of places. So if you have a space or you know a community place, then, then sort of stick, stick some plants in. But I was just gonna say as well, the very nature of nature. I mean, you know, the, the plants are diverse and they all live together. So actually it's a kind of visual um, representation of how we could be. Um, so yeah, and creating also, in, and also in the city schools, I just walked past the Camden School and while it's really lovely, I look through the windows and it's, it's all very, it's all very cream. <laughs> there's no plants in it. There's nothing on the walls. There's no views. And there's been, there's been a, um, studies to say that, you know, even if it's got patterns, so there's patterns of biophilia, you know, where you've got like these sort of fractals and, and sort of geometry of like, you know, ferns above your heads. Or, you know, if you look up now, there's like leaves above your heads. You know, that, that sort of, those sort of rep repetitive patterns that is really natural and it's beautiful for us. If we can do that and create that in schools as well, particularly in inner city schools where, I mean, there's so much stress on, on teachers as well. Um, but if we can do that, um, yeah, as you say, with people who own communities where they don't have access, um, wouldn't that be amazing? Lovely, thank you. So a real sense that um, the sense of diversity creates strong attachment, a sense of placemaking, a sense of identity that, that more deeply connects you to that space. I think that's really important. So um, obviously, for a lot of people, biophilic design is a relatively new, um, probably quite confrontational idea, even though it's backed up by all this research. And we still find that when you present research, people are rather threatened because they may have bought into design or understand that design has value. But when you present them with research that challenges that, they can be, become rather defensive. And so, you know, we're at kind of at the birth of this movement and people are here engaging which is in it, which is fantastic. But as professionals, you're going to meet barriers. So... What are those barriers that you meet and how are you finding ways to overcome those barriers to bringing nature into people's lives, into cities, into spaces to support their, their well-being? Uh, well, I'll give, maybe give a couple examples. Um, one would be uh, at, the, at the total level of a building, at a building level rather than at a detail level. So at a building level, there's a, the project we did in Edinburgh for the Botanic Gardens where the whole concept was to create a kind of glade in trees um, so that the structure 
which was designed to carry uh, a large uh, sort of matrix of timber beams as the as the roof. That was the canopy overhead. So all the little decisions that then followed, I mean, it's abstracted, it's obviously abstracted, but the little decisions like um, creating acoustic panels in the ceilings uh, where these were, were, you know, different shades of perforated material that would do the acoustic job, but give that sense of uh, woodland canopy overhead. And uh, then on a, on, a, on a sort of more, perhaps on a physiological level directly, uh, we're working in uh, Children's Hospital, um, Alder Hay Children's Hospital in Liverpool, where the whole concept goes for that hospital is the hospital in the park. So it's joining up um, uh, city parks with the NHS you know, hospital facility where the community interfaces the hospital. So the hospital doesn't become a separate campus where you go when you're, you're sick. You're thinking about the well-being of the population as a whole and parks, you know, are, are uh, contributing. Um, we've even got the chance to bring farm animals into the park and uh, I sort of have a little petting, uh, you know, zoo for the children who have severe mental health problems in the, the building that we're catering for. So then get into the detail within that building and we've created um, small, within consultation rooms, small bay windows which have a side glance view um, to, to the park. So a child can get into that sort of window seat as a little mini refuge, feel secure, feel surrounded, feel a space that's their sort of size. Kids always retreat into small spaces in a big threatening space. They tend to, to look, for the, look for the edges and the, and the, the holes in the walls where they can um, hide themselves. So this becomes, when you have mental health issues, this becomes much more important. All the circulation spaces in that building and all the waiting spaces look directly into a courtyard garden. And the courtyard garden itself is a room. It's an outdoor room which can be used by the consultants to work with the children. So almost in every aspect, we're trying to, to um, from the, from the, the direct... Uh, you know, including nature from the abstract where we're impersonating nature, if you like, um, to the physiological um, sort of uh, responses that we're seeking to, uh, you know, to, to bring out. Alia, so uh, the barriers, what are the barriers that you're facing and how do we overcome them? Oh. <laughs> well, I think there are many of them, uh, but um, what comes to my mind right away now is um, is the idea of how how to promote and to um, and to introduce biophilic design as a way that's far from the shame and blame culture. It's more about like how we can empower ourselves as designers, empower our students about this co-relationship between human being and nature. And, and how it could be delicate relationship and, and how it our our survival is based on each other and it's really important to to for especially like when we're teaching our students it's i i see like great value to avoid the blame and shame culture uh into this and more into the inclusive nature of biophilia and uh, and and when i think also about this one of the biggest challenge was also to argue for the biophilic qualities in spaces where it's less obvious. Like, for example, you could say when you think about a gothic um, a castle, you will definitely expect biophilic moment there. When you think about a forest, you would expect biophilic moment there. But actually, biophilic moments are, are possibly happening in also like the harsh urban environment. And to argue for this, you need, you need to spend time and prove it, prove that it is possible and and it's about the restorative qualities. It's about the environment ability to stimulate positive responses, regardless to the style, regardless to the the um, the um, traditional ideas of this could be good or not good. Right, so, there, so there is an idea that, from both of you that we should be bringing that connection to nature in, in what is seemingly the most inconsequential of spaces that could become quite magical for one group or another. The uh, serendipity of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Vanessa, yeah. the barriers yeah. and... Yeah. 
how would you say serendipity them? yeah exactly it's those magic moments that you get when you're under a tree <laughs> um yeah i mean i've obviously I'm, I, I suppose i look a bit hippie but when i mentioned biophilic design people go and what's that then and you you try to explain and, and you say well it's not some kind of californian tree hugging kind of concept this is actually a fundamental thing that's you know it, um from from our prehistory our sort of primal state um and i think like you say what's what's the barriers it's it's people's um misconception of what biophilic design is and what how our connection with nature is people think oh it's a touch you know it's a, it's a soft touchy feely thing and almost poo poo it but actually it's actually all this what we're doing now and you know stuff that's in the newspapers and the more we can broadcast it um that it's is fundamental to us to our well-being one of the things i i do say when i'm talking to financial advisors you know you're these networking things and you're kind of there and people look at you with a glazed look and i say to them right okay shut your eyes you know you're on these zoom things i get everybody to shut their eyes on a zoom <laughs> um and i say right okay just and i and take them through like a, a walk through a meadow or walk through a forest and then and then i say open your eyes and the, you know i just say what is that what's that feeling how do you feel and that's what we're trying to do and i that's that's the thing so it's, it's trying to um re-educate and inspire people um to to do to do something to do, you know to make a difference and to create um better acoustic and smell as well all this kind of stuff there's so many different aspects to it and i think to excite people that it's all our senses uh, you know to excite all our senses um, in a built environment, in homes, in schools, in education, in retail as well. I mean, it can increase. I mean, as well. So, what, if pretending that you know, stopping the barriers. Yeah, go back to the you know the economic benefits of biophilic design. They're humongous. Yeah. You know, really on so many levels. So, yeah, yeah you can sell more. <laughs> you. So we haven't got very much longer, but I've got two really important questions I want to ask. So we're going to do a kind of quick fire. So one minute each on just. Give us your vision of a biophilic city. If you had free reign and like, what would a biophilic city look and importantly feel like? Okay. One minute. Right, well, I'll, I'll tackle the street. So I think we're going through one of the biggest transformations that we've ever had in our streets, you know, from the time of the horse and cart to the motor car. And now the, the opportunity is there in the next uh, 10, 15 years to take back the street. So uh, uh, the, the thesis would be that, uh, that, that cars are going to go out of individual ownership. Um, therefore, you won't need to have a car parked uh, uselessly outside for most of the time. 90% of the time, cars are not used. They're just parked on streets. Um, uh, take that away. Suddenly, you have this corridor, uh, network of corridors through the city. Um, and the opportunities are amazing about how that could that that could be done. I mean, we, do we do we grow food? Do we create little linear pocket parks, you know, in our streets? Um, do we uh, take them over for pedestrian transport, scooters, bicycles? You know, that that change, that transformation in city streets, I think, is the is the most thing. And we've got to make sure we don't let them be sold by our councils and our government into private hands. <laughs> so, 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 so places for people places to inhabit. Places for people to inhabit um, yeah. outside outside our houses and our buildings. Um, you know, the, the streets will yeah. always be there and it's public space and it's going to change rapidly in the next uh, couple of decades. So, so it's human-centered design rather than designing for mechanization and transportation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Alia, one minute. One minute, because I've got one more question I've got to ask. So one minute, that's okay. all, okay? Promise? Promise. Go. <laughs> so um, I believe in the biophilic moment in the city is more than the biophilic city itself. Like, I think it will be wonderful if we could achieve biophilic cities, but I'm just worried that this is, will take us into another layer of utopia, like the, the many other utopian cities that we've been learning about throughout the history of, of um, architecture and urban planning and cities. But the idea of like the, the existing cities are not going anywhere. They are, cities are not disposable. They are here to stay. And that's why it's really important to think about how we're going to improve what we have. And even from a sustainable perspective, that's why I think that by Fulick moments in the cities are really achievable, achievable and applicable um, and eventually it could turn into a biophilic city. Great. Vanessa? Okay. Um, oh gosh. <laughs> Wildlife corridors. Wouldn't that be amazing? Um, you know, to have the birds flying above your head, to have this, to, so we can hear, I mean, are you saying, so yeah, 
getting rid of the transport as much as we can to be able to hear bird song to create wildlife corridors so we can see um you know uh ducks walking across the street, <laughs> um, ponds, places where kids can go and look at little newts swimming around and um, to have more living walls on buildings which will reduce um, air pollution. Um, yeah, gosh, there's so many things. There's so many things. And as I said, pocket parks and, you know, edible edible pop-up things that are right next to bus stops. I mean, edible bus stop lady, Mac, um, you know, she's doing fantastic stuff. Why not? Let's have, let's, let's, let's be creative and let's do it as a community level as well. Let's get the communities involved. Back to people, people-centric, get the people involved, ask them what they want to do in their community, get them involved. Everybody, you know, kids up to the grandparents, let everybody mix and, and, and network and, and make a difference. Great. And I do want to add to that a permanent fixture for planted to live where we can encourage people to engage with nature in all sorts of ways. So I'm going to add that one in. OK, so we've got down to our last five minutes, really last quick one minute burst on, you know, we've got a fantastic audience here of, of professionals, architects, interior designers, built environment professionals. What advice would you give them? Where do we go from here, both on a personal level and, and I guess more importantly, how do we take these ideas out into the wider world? One minute. What advice? Read, listen, and um, in, read as much as you can. Talk to people. Tell people everything about you know what you know, what you can learn, um, and take them out into nature. Get out more into nature. Um, just yeah, listen, listen, to, listen to my podcast. <laughs> um, but yeah, just I mean, and, and and there's so much stuff going on. There's so many amazing things. Google biophilic design. Um, you know, and tell your friends. Get into get into communication with everybody. Um, and um, if you know business owners, and just yeah, just just persuade them. Get excited about them. Take them out. Take go for a picnic and talk about it. Tell them. Try and inspire them to um, why it's good for them. Why it's why just so if once once people experience it you know then they like it it's like cake you know if you like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i like that nature is like cake everyone likes cake yeah okay <laughs> alia well biophilic design um is never a checklist it's a framework so engage your multi-sensory experience and on this validated and there's nothing wrong about it. There is nothing wrong on relying on your own experience to design better spaces and places for people. And the other thing that I think could be very important if we think from the, um, the biophilic design lens is not to play safe, to play dynamic. Think about the changes, the temporal, artificial and natural temporals and how you overlay them. Think about the dynamics of biophilia and that will protect us from turning it into a checklist. Roddy. Um, I, I think uh, don't try and do it on your own. I think, um, you know, we need to uh, work together and therefore, you know, architects need to be working from the very start on projects with, with landscape architects and with ecologists, you know, with, with the people who really understand the science um, of, of the implications of the decisions that you make. So trying to get those those teams built up from the very beginning so that that nature and landscape doesn't come along as an afterthought and get uh, pushed pushed to the side when the cost overruns. So I think it's the integration of, uh, of design teams I'd, I'd make a sort of plea for at the earliest possible stage. Yeah, make sure that our business case is sort of fundamental and that everybody understands Absolutely. how important it is. It's not just yeah. about the kind of short term costs. It's about like, those long term yeah. benefits. And of course, you know, we've got all this research that backs it up, that makes it so compelling that I think piques people's interest. But we need to keep that research going. We need to kind of integrate the ideas of the pre and post occupancy research so that, you know, before we start a project, measure where people are at and after how successful has that project been in actually delivering an enhanced connection to nature? So um, we are going to bring this to a close. Thank you very much. It's been an absolutely fascinating conversation. Um, you know, we talked about the future. You know, by 2050, 80% of the built environment that we already have will, will be here. We're only going to build 20% more. So we need to think how we're going to find ways of bringing nature back into our cities. Nature, whether it's you know real direct forms or how we mimic it or how we evoke it, how we create diverse spaces that support physical and mental resilience within the space that are going to be so important in our lives. And I'd like to thank our, our speakers today, Vanessa, 
Alia and Roddy for speaking so passionately and giving us so much inspiration about how we can bring this into our lives and into the cities in our future. This has been the first of Planted on Earth, the first planted show, the show that directly connects people, spaces with nature. Thank you very much to all of you for coming along. Thank you to our incredible panel. 